Hello, my dear students, and uh, welcome back to the lecture series on uh, work system engineering. Uh, this is lecture number 31, and uh, we'll be starting off with the uh, the economic part uh, in this uh, subject. It's not going to be too much in detail, a uh, very uh, basic kind of thing, because it's a subject by itself. So, you know, it is uh, not good to uh, handle it in uh, this subject as a whole thing. So, to define like what economic means is like it's a Greek word. Uh, ergo, if I'm not wrong, it's a uh, work. And nomics uh, means law. So it's law of working i can say law for working so you know uh, it's a human factor in engineering design or uh, in a very uh, typical way in how i can design it or i can define it uh, i can say it as uh, if you have heard about the vastu shastra kind of word so it is the vastu shastra for the industrial work, the industrial engineering. So let's, uh, you know, have the basic understanding of few things, uh, which is the part of this subject. To start with, uh, we will uh, understand what is a man-machine system. And then we will see the economic guidelines for uh, the display devices and uh, control devices. So here is the presentation on introduction to man machine systems and uh, guidelines for display and control devices. Now when I say guidelines, it is the economic guideline. Let us first talk about the man machine system. If I define it, it is a functional synthesis between a biological, psychological, social system with a technological system. Too much of jargons over there. What it refers to is in simple terms that it is a combination of human or group of people and a machine. That is, when I say biological, psychological, social system, it refers to human or group of people, and the technological system refers to the machine. And a man machine system is characterized predominantly by the interaction and functional interdependence between the two systems. Now, whichever is the man-machine system, whichever system is being produced has to provide a particular function. That means it has to yield an output. That's why it is created. And when I say output, it is either in terms of product or a service. But with a reasonable cost and under certain conditions of disturbances, which affects the human component, the machine component, or both the components. Now, when we define saying that there has to be an output, there has to be an input. And the inputs for any man machine system are the expected values of performance by both man and machine, the cost involved in setting them up, the reliability, which is a function of uptime for man and machine both, and the safety. The human task, the proportion or the, the, the part of that human task in a man-machine system, when we observe, could be classified into three sections. Generally in books you will find it as two sections, but I would like to say it in three sections. One is inspecting. Wherein you are not trying to control anything, 
but you are not trying to solve any problem, you are just inspecting it, okay, using some display devices. Then the next step is you inspect and then you control it. And then the third step, you inspect, you control, and then you solve the problem. Okay? So inspecting, controlling, and problem solving. So you may only inspect. And if you are controlling, you have to inspect and then control. But you can leave problem solving. But if you are problem solving, that means you are including controlling as well as inspecting them. Now, let's see what are the characteristics when I say a man machine system. Number one, any man machine system by its name itself, we can say should comprise of a human as a component, an equipment or a machine, and then a complete environment wherein these both components fix in. Second point to remember is that these systems don't occur naturally. These are artificially made and these are made for a specific purpose. Now, for example, in an industry, you are setting a process line. You are recruiting some operators to work on them for a specific purpose, for a specific object. Now you are going to employ a forging foreman on that forging shop or at a forging shop. You are not going to employ a CNC operator there. Correct? So it is like you have a purpose for which you are doing that. Similarly goes with the service sector. You have a specific person meant for a job who is being placed in a specific counter. And he is being given certain specific equipment. The third point says any man machine system has specific inputs and outputs and then appropriately balanced. Which means that you cannot have any kind of input given to get your desired output. For example, say that one of the input we talked is safety and now you are telling that the person has to work in a hot forging section. Now as a safety thing you are giving him a goggle but you are not giving him a glove. So that is not the specific input you have given him. He is not working on a yeah, gloves may, you know, the goggle may be important over there, but then gloves would have been much more important. You have not given him the perfect shoes, which are required for him to wear in that high temperature zone. Or you have not given him the perfect suit, which he had to wear in that hot temperature zone. Fine. So at that moment, it's obvious that he will be ending up in fatigue very quickly and you may not get your outputs by time. The productivity is going to reduce. So you need to balance that. Next thing is it is variable in size and complexity. It's obvious. It differs from process to process, industry to industry, firm to firm in size and complexity. And then it is dynamic in nature. It keeps changing with the requirement. The subsystems of the man machine system interact with other parts and also they affect other parts. The 
The last point says the environmental factors or the system environment affects the system performance. It can be anything, the temperature condition or the work condition, the vibrations, the sound conditions, whatever it is, it is going to affect your system performance. So it has to be taken care of and not only the man and machine. Coming to the classification, we have three types. First one is the manual system, which is the most simplest one. The complete thing is done by the human operator. It is the most flexible one, smallest in size. When I say smallest in size, it is like in the entire industrial scenario or the service sector. This contributes to the smallest portion. And then there is a considerable variability because uh, not every worker is going to work in the same manner, same method. Now I may hammer it, you know, I may hammer a particular part while forging with certain force and certain movement of my arm. The other person may not be the same. Coming to the service sector, my way of counting the currency notes will be different than the other one. Or my way of dealing with the customers may be different from others. Okay, so this manual system has considerable variability and there are only simple tools and equipment which are used there. Now coming to the second one, it is mechanical system, which is like partial automation. Yes, it is a bit more complex than the first one and a little bit inflexible compared to the manual one. The machine component here is power driven and the human activity is information processing, decision making and controlling. So keying something into the computer and then that giving you the data when it is coming to the service sector or you know you giving a particular code to the CNC and it giving you the, oh I can't call it as a partial thing there, but yes I can. CNC is not completely automated. So you are giving a code there and you are waiting for it to finish the work. So you are controlling it. Correct? If you want to stop it in between, you have that push button. You can stop it. I don't call it as a automation. It's a partial automation. Then comes, uh, you know, the last type which is known as the automatic system. It is a complex system in which automatic devices perform all the operational functions. You can relate it to artificial intelligence or something like that. The operational functions are sensing information, processing decision making and action. It is completely inflexible and cannot be adopted to uses other than the one for which it has been designed. Now here the human element performs the job of only monitoring, performing the function, maintenance and upkeep, just maintaining that system, that's all, because all other things are done by that. Now said here saying the automatic telephone exchange, I hope, you know, like when you have given a call, you don't have a control over there, right? It's already fed and then you just say press one, press two, so you just go on pressing that particular number and it diverts you to the right place. It senses what you have clicked. But you know, to be very frank, there is no perfect reliable automatic system which exists till now, as of my knowledge. But yes, today's generation, you might be knowing much better than me. There might be, which is not in my knowledge. If it is there, you can quote that as an example. You can comment over here. Coming to the ergonomic guidelines for now display devices. Before we say that, let us see what are the various display devices. There are three types. Basically two. But in the first type, there are again two subtypes. 
basic two types are the analog device and the digital device and then again if you tell me in detail analog type 1 analog type 2 and then display and when i say analog type 1 it is the dial is fixed and the pointer is moving an example is uh, your speedometer so the dial is fixed over there what you see is the pointer moving and then the analog display system type 2 where the pointer is may have fixed and the dial moves so you know if you have seen the barcode hardness tester though it comes in the first type but when you are trying to adjust it for calibration you can uh, make it act as uh, the analog uh, display system too you can fix the you know pointer and then you can move the dial any other example if it comes to your mind you can comment it over here again digital uh, display system i don't have to explain it to you you have the counters which you use okay wherein the numbers get displayed is there in your uh, smartphones also now now let us see what are the ergonomical guidelines for them so mostly it is considering only the analog display because you know digital display system uh, the ergonomic design mostly will be like the number should be appropriately visible to you okay and uh, it should be like handy and all those things but majorly the guidelines are uh, given in most of the textbooks for the dial and pointer type so let us see it says the degree of accuracy shown on the dial must be following the required accuracy so it must be appropriately calibrated so if a dial gives an accuracy greater than the required makes reading more difficult and leads to reading error i hope you have experienced this most of the time <laughs> and uh, you try to calibrate the measuring devices second point the dial should give the correct and needed information to the operator while working on the machine third point as far as possible the subdivision should be in multiples of 1 2 or 5 since other subdivisions may raise difficulties in putting the correct information you know these values are very easy when it is in ones or twos or fives it's easy to calculate if it is fours threes sevens nines you know to calculate it quickly it becomes a bit difficult until unless you are very strong with mathematics right the figures should be attached when i say figures it is the numbers <coughs> should be attached to the significant scale markings which may be after the one two or five subdivisions the numerical figure should be tangential on a moving scale and upright on a fixed scale to understand it better you can always remember the speedometers or any of the dial gauges that you have seen okay i have not given any kind of figures over here because this is not something very new to all of you it is very well understood all these points the pointer must have sharp arrow or tipped point to show the correct numerical value because if it is having a blunt arrow kind of thing you won't be able to understand which subdivision it is being showing right and then it should not cover the numbers or the scale otherwise you'll be confused then the pointer should move in the same plane so that the parallax can be avoided the sizes of letters and figures must be adjusted to the expected distances between the eye and information display and for that you have a formula height of the letters or figures in mm is equal to visual distance in mm by 200 this is the standard formula which is used 
So these are the general guidelines which are used for display devices. I would like you to go through this once again so that it is pretty much clear and I request you to go through it and whenever you are reading this out, kindly try to remember any one of the dial gauges or you can even have a look at your watch. That's also one of the simplest example. Yes, that's also a dial gauge, right? Simplest one. I can't call it as a dial gauge, but yes, somewhat very similar. Now, for the ergonomic guidelines on my control devices, I'll be just moving on the slides, but I will not be you know, reading them out because I would like you to read them out on your own and then understand them because it is not a complicated one. It's all about the knobs, lever, push button and switches which you have been using in your daily life as an engineering student. Okay, you have used this in a lathe machine or in a shaper or at your, you know, even maybe in your homes. You will be using it in your daily life. I just, if you want, I'll just go through it. So in the first general guideline, it just says that the position of that particular control device, whether it is knob, lever, push button, switch, steering, relay switch or handle must be at a ease of access. The location must be at a ease of access for you. It should not be somewhere, you know, at a position which is out of your reach because at a moment when you want to stop a particular equipment all of a sudden or start a particular equipment, it should not be that you are taking all the stress to do that. The second point says that it should have a consistency of motion. That means first time when you turn it towards right side, maybe clockwise direction, that means you are increasing, say it is a voltage equipment, the knob is for increasing the voltage and you are moving it in a clockwise direction then that equipment should increase the voltage not only for the first time but each time you do it it should do the same thing it should not be like second time you increase it and it should decrease the voltage the there should be a principle of consistency of motion there and then as far as possible the scales and knobs meant for the same function should be placed together. That means it should not be like, what I meant to say over here is it should not be something like, uh, now you are reading the pressure bar. I hope you remember a few of the experiments where you have to uh, read the pressure. Okay. And you have that manometer. You are trying to increase the pressure using a knob or something. And your manometer is somewhere at the backside of the instrument. So you are employing one more person to read it. Instead of that, it should be always nearby you. So either it should be placed sideways or if it is a smaller thing, it should be, you know, at the upper side. That's what uh, has been uh, explained in uh, third and fourth. Coming to the fifth point. It says that the motion of the pointer of the scale or dial should be consistent for the control. It should not be that you say that for the first time to increase 1 mm, you are moving it for say by one revolution or say uh, not one revolution, I mean to say uh, for one click. 
and then next time you want to move it for 1 mm you are again you need to go for two clicks or something so what it says is it should be consistent the next point is the subdivisions and numerals should not strain the eyes on those control devices there something is written right it should not strain your eyes it should be very clear the control device should be marked appropriately you know where is on where is off and sometimes nowadays uh, they give color codings red is for off green is for on and then appropriate thing should be there like it is for speed feed or whatever is the thing if it is a cnc the shape or alignment should be appropriate that you handle it appropriately you know it should not be in a very odd shape that you can't handle it the control device should be conventional you know it should not be something very new that you see it and you don't know how to operate it because most of the time what happens is people when they see unconventional items they get uh, annoyed with it they uh, not annoyed in a sense like they don't get very easily adjusted to it uh there has been a case also like uh, you know the control device let us consider the bike itself in few of the bikes i don't remember exactly which one were the, those the brakes and the gear were made to look similar the pedals and uh, it so happened that during those olden days there were many accidents due to that yeah now people have got that understanding but earlier suddenly when that conventional thing was changed there were many accidents so you should not suddenly you know have a unconventional way of doing the things with the handling devices then the control position should be designed in a logical sequence that means say in a cnc you have that always like feed speed thing very nearby those two knobs are very nearby okay so you understand and then uh, not feed speed i mean to say uh, you know like for example say all those alphabets are in one group wherein you are giving all the things together like grouping is done appropriately okay now consider the switchboard your fan regulator is always near to the fan switch it's not like your switch is at one place and your regulator is on the opposite wall direction or you know your regulator is at one place and uh, the switch for the fan is some three buttons after that so you tend to switch on all the buttons but a normal tendency is that whenever you tell someone to switch on the fan he will always see the button which is near to that regulator right so that's what it is said like logical sequence to prevent any kind of erroneous operation so that's all my dear friends and uh, i hope uh, the lecture was clear and i'm very sorry that uh, i have been huffing because of uh, some health issues so that's the reason that uh, i have been not efficiently been able to you know uh, uh, conduct this particular portion i hope but still i have uh, given my best and uh, hope you have understood the portion uh, i would request you to go through the slide second and again and uh, you know uh, for this part of uh, the subject i would request you to go through the video second and again so that you know you can learn it in a much better way so thank you again for uh, patient listening uh, take care of yourself and uh, yes thank you again be safe be at home